Well, thank you, Dr. Endelman. And uh, I'm going to guess that we would have some comments and we'll move this out of the way. Todd. Okay. I have a question for you. It's a little bit long, but I would, I think it's an important question and I'd really like to hear your answer to it. You wrote, you spoke, you told us that pre-World War II anti-Semitism was linked with all the aspects of anti-modernism, such as anti-liberalism, anti-capitalism, etc. Now, I assume that part of the reason anti-Semitism was linked with this anti-modernism is that Jews were seen as carriers of some of these modernizing trends. So that Jews were indeed seen as carriers of capitalism because what else could Jews have done in Europe? Jews could have seen, been seen as carriers of liberalism because it was in Jews' interests to develop liberal and to develop and partake of liberal philosophies. Um, now, this is different, as you said, from post-Holocaust anti-Semitism because A, of the absence of reactions to the Holocaust, B, because of the absence of the State of Israel, et cetera. Now, I'm wondering, now clearly this ascription to Jews of anti-modernism, of yeah. hatred, right, of, pre, of encouraging modernism is ideological. And so I'm wondering whether, as you can point to, some of the other carriers of those modernizing trends and help us understand why they all got pinned on the Jews rather than on some of the other groups and structures that carried them, especially, as you said, that um, anti-Semitism is not hardwired. The question, is, is my microphone on? Is it on now? Yes, there you go. I'll, 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 I'll just get very close to the mic. I'll hold it this way, okay? The question that Lynn asked is, uh, in part, the question, why the Jews? Uh, that is to say, why, why the Jews became um, the chief um, bearers of all these modern trends that people who were dissatisfied with the way that traditional societies were moving uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And I think there are two answers for this. First of all, it's clear that there was a, if you will, a pre-existing uh, tendency to see Jews as the creators of problems. They were pegged for that position by Christian anti-Semitism. That is, both modern anti-Semitism of the anti-modern variety and traditional Christian religious anti-Semitism see Jews as the embodiment of the evil. It's just that the kind of evil they represent has changed. But why the Jews is partly determined by that question, i.e. what I'm saying is the legacy of traditional religious theologically based anti-Semitism, in addition to the fact that the Jews benefited trans benefited perhaps more than any other single group from the forces of modernization. No group caused modernization, okay? But Jews, because they were in commercial enterprises before the creation of liberal laissez-faire capitalist economies, were poised to take advantage of the opportunities that opened up when restrictions disappeared and economies became freer. So they prospered. And because of that, they were blamed for it, rather than seeing being beneficiary of larger transformations. Similarly, the notion of a meritocratic or a liberal society, or a society in which people can uh, achieve, in theory, what they want, uh, based upon their own talents, runs counter to notions of inherited status, be they of petty bureaucrats or be they of aristocrats. Again, Jews benefited from that. They were the self-made men, and I use the term men uh, quite uh, consciously, of the 19th century uh, par excellence. Not that there weren't other groups. Moreover, 
Europeans had been accustomed to seeing Jews on the margins of society. And someone who's on the margins, who then appears in the center, is, I won't say necessarily will always bring resentment, but it's not unlikely that that kind of movement to the center will attract unwanted attention. If I could draw an analogy, I was always struck by the number of anti-Hillary Clinton jokes <coughs> when Bill Clinton was in office, particularly in the early years before he got involved with Monica, then the jokes changed. Um, and I think the reason of it was it resented, in fact, the preeminence of a woman in a position of power. And it's, you know, and I think that's in part what was going on. When you were accustomed to people on the margins of society, they move to the center and they exert influence, they have an impact, uh, they are well-to-do, they are articulate, and these people have been despised beforehand, that is bound to create problems. Uh, and I think that's what happened. Thank you. Hello, working now? <clears throat> Great, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I want to pick up on the last, uh, uh, Todd's last comment. Um, uh, by the way, I, I agree with everything in this paper, so what I'm about to say here is not, not in the form of disagreement, but of, of trying to reflect on some issues that he raised. The, um, uh, the, the fact that Jews are seen now as having power, uh, and especially in uh, uh, Jewish sovereign power in the state of Israel, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, he's, he's put his finger on something very important here, and here I'd like to link it back to traditional anti-Semitism. This is the kind of dialectic that Yehuda Bauer was speaking of. That is, traditional anti-Semitism hates the Jews, but as long as the Jews remain in a certain place, which is spelled out for them, that is, on the margins, uh, as a uh, uh, persecuted minority, that is, Augustine's... Uh, uh, position on the Jews, Jews, which was accepted as canonical by the, uh, by the Catholic Church, is that the Jews have to be kept alive because they are witnesses to the, uh, uh, the veracity of the prophecies of the coming of Jesus, but they can never be allowed to be in a position um, uh, other than a marginal one, and that is an indication of their, uh, that God has in fact now chosen another, uh, another uh, uh, church. Um, now, the problem with Israel is that it violates this, and it violates it both for Christians and for Muslims. Um, Jews are not supposed to have sovereign power in the sphere of Islam. Um, and similarly, the idea of Jews having power, uh, sovereign power, is offensive to this traditional Christian idea, and that's why the Pope at the time of Herzl rejected any kind of support of Zionism. Um, so I think that's what, that's what we're facing today, is, is the, the uh, remainder of, or the, this old trope is still there, but now because Jews have changed their position, it can reemerge in a kind of new form, but it's still dialectically the product of the, of the earlier form. Now I'd like to, the second point I want to make is, is actually a more uh, difficult one, I think for all of us, including everyone in this audience, and that is that when we say, as Todd correctly did, that the obsession of certain people um, with Israel, that is, of labeling Israel as the most horrendous regime in the world, um, this obsession with Israel, and we, we rightly see in this a hallmark of anti-Semitism. The problem we have, I think, what is very uneasy for us is we also have an obsession with Israel. We also see Israel as unique, um, and therefore, our uh, concern for Israel, it's very hard when we hear somebody else who's concerned for Israel to turn to them and say, well, you should treat all nations equally. We don't. And that puts us in a very problematic position around these kind of arguments. Now, it seems to me that uh, the problem we have with all of this, on the one hand, we, we're, we rightly label this kind of thinking anti-Semitism. And on the other hand, we, I think, as supporters of Israel, as Jews, uh, I believe ha we've got a real problem here. The problem is that we have the only, this is the only case of a democratic country that is ruling another population that does not have citizenship rights. And uh, this is a situation which uh, is rightly called apartheid. 
Now, we know what happened with South Africa. That is, it became a pariah nation uh, because it was a heron folk democracy. That is, a democracy for the, the ruling people, but not for, uh, not for its African majority. Unfortunately, the situation in Israel is beginning to resemble that. And so therefore, we face, I think, an extremely difficult problem here, where on the one hand, we uh, have to recognize this issue, we have to address this issue, um, and on the other hand, when we hear people saying exactly the same thing that many of us are saying, we label it anti-Semitism. So I guess my question is, you know, how do we resolve this contradiction? Well, I, I, what I've tried to, as a rule of thumb, uh, my thing is that it has always been that those people who want to discuss Israel, if we're talking about, about, about a binational state, we have something to talk about. Otherwise, we have nothing to talk about. And I'm primarily not concerned with those people who would argue that, um, who, who, would, who would, those persons who would argue uh, that the answer is a binational state and Israel must you know, withdraw, that's one kind of thing. But the problems I was talking about are people who aren't concerned with, bi with, with the binational, the old, if you will, partition solution of the Peel Commission from the 30s. Uh, who simply want to do away with it, and that's when it gets involved with it. Um, now, depending on who, if you believe polls, the majority of Israelis want some sort of binational solution. Uh, if true, uh, then in fact, all of the other kinds of <coughs> arguments are not, are not critical, and we don't face that kind of problem. Our problem is not, uh, as I said before, the problem is for us to distinguish between those who cry wolf all the time and those who, I would say like myself, who cry wolf occasionally. <laughs> uh, or who's, you know, I think I do see a wolf. And, uh, and I tried to make that distinction. It requires making distinctions that are oftentimes very hard to make. Uh, and the problem is, as I tried to suggest, this obsession with Israel has become so rooted, at least in Europe, on the left, that people are born into it. It's like a child who grows up in a Republican or a Democratic family. That child would be a Republican or a Democrat, probably. Uh, and very likely will vote and have the same views as his or her parents. And similarly, one who comes into a political movement accepts the whole platform, even without thinking about it. I see it among my own friends. I find it very disturbing. Um, so, you know, I don't know how you make people think more clearly. Uh, I wish I knew. That's the business we're in teaching in universities. We still don't know how to do it, though. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me take a moment here uh, to check on time. We, are, we, we, ha we have what time uh, can we go to? We have ten more minutes, and you would have wanted to say. Well, I, I think actually, uh, oh, there we are, Mr. Wayne. Okay, great. Well, we measure our time. Then. I'll make it quick. Um, I want to suggest to you some arguments that I've certainly heard from people who I would consider to be, if they are anti-Semites, they're unconscious anti-Semites, they're well-meaning people. Ask how you feel about certain approaches towards Israel that come from people who say, well, I'm not an anti-Semite, but this is why I'm critical of Israel to the point of really thinking that the very structure of the state has to be radically altered. One point would be, yes, the Jews have suffered horribly, and yes, they have national rights and collective rights, but the realization of those rights like the realization of Kurdish national rights in the entire Kurdish world, simply could only be done at such a cost in terms of destabilizing the Middle East that it simply, it creates far more problems than it solves. It's not an insult to the Jewish people. They suffer, they have rights, but it simply can't be done just as the world is not a perfect place. Uh, second argument that I hear is that um, the state of Israel and its conflict with the Arab world is quite unusual and that it's made possible entirely as the result of a single patron uh, the United States, which supports Israel to the tune of providing at 50 times more foreign aid per capita than any other country. And although, yes, there are many patron-client state relationships in the world, the Soviet Union certainly supported many states, uh, the United States' relationship with Israel is quite unique. And then the third argument I hear is that uh, the fact is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict takes place in the Holy Land. It's a land which is considered sacred to something about mm, between half and two-thirds of the world's population. So naturally, events in that area are going to attract more attention than events in, I don't know, Samoa. And uh, related to these three points, I would just ask another question, another thought experiment. Let's say there were a Jewish state, and it were in 
know, sub-Saharan Africa or uh, Southeast Asia, and there were an indigenous population and there were a nationality conflict, do you think the conflict would take the same sort of public form? Would it have the same kind of centrality in the minds of European uh, critics of Israel? Let, let me just start with the last question, uh, because it's very much related to the uh, point I was trying to make. Jews, and consequently their history, and consequently their effort to establish a sovereign state, have always attracted a disproportionate amount of attention because initially in Western culture, or in Western civilization, Jews are there at that, if you will, fratricidal moment when the two religions, or the two groups, emerge into two separate religions. Uh, and if anything, what I am surprised by is how is the uh, power that these, if you will, myths have uh, in the Western imaginations. That partly explains why. I mean, there various new states have appeared uh, since the end of World War II, but you're absolutely right, this receives a disproportionate amount of attention. And it, you could say it's, it's not just due to anti-Semitism, it's due simply to the place of Jews in, if you will, in the Western imagination, myths about Jews, and unfortunately oftentimes those myths are of a uh, prejudicial character. Um, and that really was, and, and so with other states, so that was the last two questions I think you asked. Your first question was, uh, what about those people who say, well, yes, in an ideal world it would be nice to have a Jewish state, but look, at the consequences are so uh, destabilizing, uh, and uh, Palestinians will suffer so much because of that. Now, in any, and my answer in part is again, there's a double standard at work here. If, and I think I mentioned this specifically, if our standard is that no national state should be established and cause any suffering to any other national group, then I suggest that we start with the really important uh, nation states that have infringed on the national rights, including most of North and South America. You'll have to give up your citizenship. I'm not sure where you're supposed to go. But I, I think the wealth of all these countries should be the wealth of all these countries should be turned over to the Native Americans, who are the true national group. So obviously the establishment of every sovereign state. The question is to work, and if that's what, if that's what people say, the destabilizing business I think was answered very well uh, by yourself, actually. Because, in fact, you gave us this counterfactual reading of history, which I agree with, that if we try this sort of imaginative experiment and think there was no state of Israel, we know the Middle East would still be a mess because it's got oil and because there's anti-Western feeling in Islam. So the notion that somehow you get rid of the, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict and then Gan Eden appears the next day uh, is a myth. And so my argument is, there was one though, you had a four part question. We started writing after you started. I didn't realize it was so many parts. What was, there was one part I missed. It was about, um, you know, the Israeli dependence, unusual amount of dependence on the United States. I mean, the foreign aid is just absolutely yeah. astronomical in comparison with any other country and the relationship between that and the perpetuation of the occupation. Yeah. Well, there's, there's no question that circumstances um, you know, you could either say uh, beggars have no, ch you know, can't be choosers. There may not be that much more an offer in terms of the United States. Now, the United States became involved in the first place uh, because of the Soviet intervention, and that's gone. Uh, once it has certain commitments, though, uh, they tend to move very slowly. For example, look at the American commitment to South Korea. It's not working. Yeah, it's a little. All right, is this better? Oh, this is. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so it takes a long time for those to disentangle. Uh, one could imagine that American foreign aid would, to Israel would continue at a very high, at this extraordinarily high rate, even if, let's say, there were a peace agreement tomorrow and the establishment of Palestinian state. Because it takes a long time for these things to disengage. Um, that in and of itself, uh, I don't find problematic. My, from my own political viewpoint, I would have liked the United States at certain times to put a little more pressure on. Um, how this is done, though, is, you know, it depends on how it has to do with American domestic politics and 
and not just Jews anymore, but with the evangelical right, which is just as, which has many more votes than the Jewish community, and for its own uh, millenarian reasons is interested in <clears throat> the return of all the Jews to the land of Israel prior to their conversion. Very brief then. I think that uh, Derek, I think that, uh, Derek Penzler's uh, point about the people who say that uh, the cost of the Jewish state is too high is really counterfactual because uh, Israel exists today with five and a half million Jews and to abolish Israel means uh, basically another catastrophe. So uh, the solution obviously is not uh, to abolish an existing uh, community but to arrange for a peace agreement between that and the, its neighbors. But what I wanted to comment on is uh, in, a, in an excellent paper that, uh, that I, like uh, David, uh, agree with, basically, is uh, the, the, when, when you t talk about Western Europe, uh, you talk about a rather limited area uh, in which, however, the Jews were a very important element in uh, modern times. And, and you adduce a number of uh, reasons why the anti-Semitism there grows. And I think there is a very basic one which we miss very often. And that is that the Jews simply are not French, and not Belgian, and not Dutch, and not German. They are Jews. In other words, they are strangers. They are the only strangers in Europe outside of the gypsies. And Jews don't like the comparison with the gypsies, but it works. And I think that it's very important to note that the American conception of what, uh, what nationality and ethnicity is does not apply to Europe. In Europe, in, there are no such uh, creatures in the 19th century as Jewish Germans or Jewish Poles. You could be either a German or a Jew. You couldn't be a Pole. You couldn't be a Jewish Pole. You could be either a Pole or a Jew. Now, many Jews didn't think that way. Jews considered themselves to be Germans. Some Jews considered themselves to be Poles. That's not the way the Germans looked at them and not the way the Poles looked at them. And this is a basic, very, very basic thing. You mentioned it by implication. It's the traditional uh, way that Jews were looked at from a Christian um, anti-Jewish point of view. But it goes, it, it becomes, as you again rightly said, it becomes a cultural phenomenon. It's not a question of this or that. Uh, factor. The other point is, you know, we all miss in this discussion a very major element. The United Nations have become a forum for these things to be played out. And there you have a combination of all the factors together. Durban was an excellent example of that. A combination of traditional anti-Semitism, racist anti-Semitism, Islamic radicalism, etc., etc., combined. And the United Nations sees Israel today as a pariah, clearly, openly, radically. Israel is not a member of any of the, of the uh, special groups that of which the United Nations consists. It's not part of the African, the Asian, or the European group. It cannot be elected to any, any position at the United Nations. When you have the Human Rights Commission meeting in Geneva, literally, 40% of all the decisions about that, of that group concern the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which cannot be explained by the fact that, uh, that, that Palestine is a holy land to three religions. The Libyans don't care about that. So w we, are, we are faced with another form of anti-Semitism, which is they're directly connected with the fact that the Jews have a state. The uh, final uh, comment, very brief, you say, is there a solution to this? Is there a future? You say quite rightly, of course, as, a, as historians, we, could, we mustn't do uh, uh, predictions. We are pretty hopeless when it comes to prophecies. But I think that one can sketch two conditions under which anti-Semitism would probably either decline very much or maybe in a far future even disappear. And that is, A, a pluralistic society that recognizes the right not only of individuals but of groups to be different from each other. That would mean that I as if you are a Jewish group or an Irish group or an Italian group or whatever, 